right, if you would turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, I'm going to give you two to turn to, Exodus chapter 20 and John chapter 15. Um, This is going to be a little communion devotion today for just to prepare our hearts to take communion. And... um, And if you're, if you're joining us live stream, again, if you just come in a little bit late, I mentioned we're going to have communion. And so what you can actually do, you can push pause and you can run and get some bread or some crackers and some juice and you can do communion with us as well, which we're going to do uh, in a couple minutes. So um, I was thinking about what, you know, what I was going to do for, for devotion and just kind of um, kind of wanted to connect it to Exodus, but I was just going crazy. Then all of a sudden, it was actually, I got out of the shower Friday morning, and that's when it hit me. It's like, ah, it was one of those things like, ah, let's do this. And so, I, you know, I like when, I wish God would do that stuff like on Tuesday instead of waiting till Friday. It's just a lot easier for me to do, th- to do it. But Exodus chapter 20, now that's where the Ten Commandments are. That's where we've been the past couple of weeks, past three weeks. And immediately after that, we're going to pick it up in verse 18 in Exodus chapter 20. And here's what it says. It says, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and spoke in smoke, they trembled with fear. And they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. God has come just to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Now, oh, this is going to be a problem. Okay. Okay. Now, these continue to be different times for us, adapting to uh, the new habits or new COVID habits. For instance, how many of you have uh, went out shopping and you got halfway across the parking lot and then it it hits you, oh, crap, I forgot my mask, (laughs) right? That happened to anybody, right? Um, I I mean, it's numerous times. That's happened to me. Um, and uh, um, we, we have these new, new habits that we've developed where, uh, you know, when I have a conversation with someone and then all of a sudden I find myself backing up a little bit, maintaining that social distance just so I'm not getting so close to someone. You know, it's just, it's just a, a naturally just kind of backing away, keeping, keeping that, that uh, six feet. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of self-conscious now, even by what we touch, right? My son took a return the library book back to the library uh, that my wife had checked out. And as he, he got to the library, you know, he's handing it to the librarian and her response, she just recoiled and like, you know, put it in the slot, put it in the slot. And so there's, you know, there's all these new New, we're watching what we're touching, paying attention. You know, even when you go to the gas station and stuff like that. I was hiking this past weekend, and, and there I was surprised the number of people that were wearing masks, even out, even out in the woods on the hiking trail. In fact, you know, if you had passed somebody, you know, on a trail and it's kind of skinny, you know, you just kind of move off to the side and, you know, hey, how you doing? Now what I've been noticing people doing is they, they step off to the side further into the woods and they'll face the other direction <laughs> like give you the head nod over th- you know in fact i saw i saw this one couple they must not been related um or or live in the same household or whatever but they had stopped for lunch and he was off the trail about 15 feet in the woods sitting on a log over here. She was over on this side, 15 feet in the woods, sitting on the log, and they were having a conversation, eating lunch. You know, just things are differently uh, now, nowadays. Uh, now, social distancing is good. It's, it's something that, that is important for helping to stop, 
spread the virus. But if you notice in our scripture this morning that we've got a social distancing thing going on, how the people reacted to God after they received the Ten Commandments. They were afraid of God's awesomeness. And so we find them keeping their distance here. Even after Moses said, hey, 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 it's cool. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. The people are still like, don't let God speak to us again. Please, we'll stay over here. Thank you very much. We're going to maintain a social distance with God. Now, I understand that. I understand the idea of people wanting to back away from God uh, and maintaining a social distance from God because we do that sort of thing. We do that sort of thing. Has God ever prompted you to forgive someone and you were like, you know, but you don't know how they hurt me and I'm not, I'm not ready to forgive. And you know, that creates a social distance between us and God. Or if God puts on your heart that you should go and apologize to that person uh, because what you did was wrong. And it's like, well, yeah, I don't want to do that, you know, and it's not, wasn't that big of a deal anyhow, and they're probably, they're probably not even worried about it, it's probably all just water under the bridge to them anyhow, but still, God has put that on your heart, and when we don't do what God prompts us to do, we are creating a distance between us and God. When God prods us to participate in a ministry, and you know, we feel we know that's something that we could do, but then we say, oh, I don't want to be tied down doing that. It's just, that's going to put me out too much. I can remember back when I was in college, and I was part of the Christian fellowship group, and, and I had one of the leaders come to me and just say, Greg, um, there's this children's ministry going at this, this church, you know, down in town. You would be perfect for it. You know, it's like every Thursday afternoon, you know, would you like to do that? And I remember my response was, uh, was very simply, mm, as I thought about it, I said, no, nah, I don't want to be tied down to doing something like that every week. I want, I want to have my freedom to do whatever I want to do. If my friends are doing something fun, I want to have the freedom to do that. Now, I remember that 40 years ago. And you don't think that that was something in my life that I realized, you know, God had placed an opportunity in front of me. And I just said, no, no thanks. I just kind of back away. You know, some, some of us are just, we're just too busy running from morning to evening, involved in good activities, but we find ourselves so busy that we are just drifting away from God. Some of us can feel guilty from the past decisions that we've made in our life, just the way the things that we've done in our past and the, and the guilt and and we feel maybe there's a sense that God is disappointed with us. With I, I let down God yet again. And that creates a social distance between us and God. Or sometimes, you know, you hear me talk a lot about, you know, be, be still and know that I am God, like it says in the scripture. Or to be silent, just have silent time with God. And there are a lot of people that struggle with quiet and silence and stillness before God because a lot of times people don't like what they hear inside because when we're silent and when we're still, there's a, then all of a sudden we can hear ourselves and we know I don't, we don't like what's inside of us. And so we like to drown it out with all kind of other noise. That's why the TV is a lot, on a lot. Um, but that, w when we, you know, there's a healing in getting that out. And when we don't, we are creating a distance between us and God. And there's people today that have a fear of the coronavirus or that have a fear and what's going to be the outcome of this election. And that's an unhealthy fear that drives us away from God instead of driving us to him. You see, I think the times are definitely different, but we're not that much different than the Hebrew people that we read about in Exodus. And there are times when God appears to us today and it just freaks us out. And so we tell God, just keep your distance. We just kind of back away. So there's this distance between us and God. And the reason why we sometimes feel that distance between us and God is because of us. It's because of us. 
Isaiah chapter 59 says this, there's nothing wrong with God, the wrong is in you. Your wrong-headed lives cause the split between you and God. Whenever we disobey God, that's what the Bible calls sin. And the nature of sin is that it separates us from God and creates this distance between us. But thankfully, even though we are socially distant with God, God is not socially distant with us. Jesus has bridged the gap. Jesus went to the cross and he took on the sin of the world and he set us free. He set us free from guilt and from shame and from the penalty of sin. Jesus came to earth to show us what God is really like. He revealed that God is not mean or angry or disappointed in us, but that he desires a close relationship with the humanity that he has created. And Jesus showed us how to maintain that close relationship with God, to, to how, how to get rid of any social distancing between us and God. And so Jesus kind of explained that in John 15. If you have your Bibles, you turn to John 15. Awesome passage of Scripture. Awesome passage of Scripture. Jesus is with his disciples on the last night that he is on the earth. And his closest friends, his disciples are, they're scared because something's going on here and the way Jesus has been talking and they can just feel that there's something weird and strange going on. They're confused, they're scared enough, they're beginning to get depressed and they're just afraid. But John records this conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, and it's awesome. So we're going to pick it up in verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Chapter 15, verse 1. Here's what Jesus says. And so imagine, imagine Jesus speaking to you. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now that word remain there is pretty common here in this chapter. It means to to abide, to dwell in. And so Jesus is saying, listen, tell his disciples, telling us that we cannot afford to live life socially distant from him. He's telling this, be close, stay connected to me, live in me, but know that I'm already going to be living in you. There's no social distancing is what Jesus is saying here. And so let's continue on in verse five. And again, look for the remains in here. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. Think about what Jesus is saying there if we remain in him. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Man, if I got a Bible, I underline that, for that verse right there. That is so awesome. Think of what Jesus is saying. Because so often we, get, we think that Jesus is bringing down the hammer on people. He's doing just the opposite right here, encouraging his disciples at the low point of their life. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete perfect, whatever. My command is this, 
Love each other as I have loved you. Now, if you catch the last couple verses right there, Jesus tells us two ways that we can decrease the social distance between us and him. Number one, he says this, keep his commandments. Keep his commandments, listen to his words. And number two is love one another. Keep his commandments and love one another. Now, Luke chapter 22, Luke also records something that Jesus said on that last night when he was with his disciples. And they were celebrating the Passover meal. And he writes this. And he took bread, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. These symbolic, these symbols of bread and juice and our participation in them, we remember what Jesus did for us that took away that distance between us and God, that he went to the cross. And just like the Hebrew people were freed from their bondage of of slavery in Egypt, we are no longer slaves to sin, to death, and to the devil. We are free from the penalty of sin, of guilt, of shame. We are free from death. Like the Hebrew people, they are now free, as we've been reading in Exodus. They were free now to become the people of God. We now are free to be the people of God. There is now no distance between us and God. Speaker and writer Tony Campolo shares a story from his youth about taking communion. And he recalls that he was sitting in church one day and he was about six or seven years old and he became aware of a young woman that was sitting in the pew in front of him and she was, she was sobbing. She was just shaking her head. And uh, the minister had just finished reading the scripture um, by the Apostle Paul that is in Corinthians. And it said this, Whosoever shall eat bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And so as the communion plate with the little pieces of bread was passed in front of this woman, she was crying and, and sobbing and just shaking. She just kind of waved it away, and she bowed her head in despair. Tony said it was then that his Sicilian father leaned over her shoulder and told the woman in his broken English, and he told her sternly, Take it, girl. It was meant for you. Do you hear me? And he said she raised her head and she nodded and then took the bread and ate it. And Tony said, I knew at that moment that some kind of heavy burden had been lifted from her heart and her mind. He said, since then I have always known that a church that could offer communion to hurting people was a special gift. From God. We celebrate communion this morning not because we are perfect, not because we have uh, life all together, but we do so because we are broken people. We are hurting people and we are sinful people. But because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that set us free. Now sin's power to separate us from God has been defeated. And that's worth celebrating here this morning. And so we're going to sing a song. And while Madeline plays and leads us in singing, um, if there's anything that as you think about it, as we sing, if there's anything that you know that maybe has created a distance between you and God, anything that you perceive, anything that God brings to your mind, do this. Simply confess it and give it up to God. Right? 
Now's the time to do that as Madeline leads us uh, in remembrance of me.